here's a minute or half a knot, whichever comes first. Okay. I'm Sorry, that's on more on like it. one knot, I guess. We're diving to an expected depth of about 2,400 meters, 30 meters a minute. The math teacher in me Thank says, you. do the math. And uh, we have some blue water time here for your questions. So we are getting a question from someone uh, about why our control room is so dark. My question would be, why is our control room so cold? But uh, that, that's just me. Well, we're dark. I think so. Uh, we have uh, great views of our monitors. And we're cold, so we keep all the computer equipment at an ideal temperature. I thought maybe it was to make us feel like we were all creatures of the deep. That's just a bonus. <laughs> This is our eighth dive here in Papahonu Mokuakea Marine Monument. If you're just tuning in, we are several hundred mi miles west of the See Hawaiian the Islands. Need it. Oh yeah, it's still there. We're exploring on this uh, expedition, which is called Lu'uaea Ahiki'i Kapapaku, which was the name given to us by the cultural working group. And it means go down, go up, go down, go up until you reach the ocean floor. And that's exactly what we're doing. This is our eighth dive. So here we go, down again. Down again, tectonic turtle friends. Tectonal, tectonic turtles are doing 5.59 turtles. Wow. Oh, we're moving. It's faster than we've ever gone before. <laughs> <laughs> this is turtle FTL. Yeah, turtle power. <laughs> Giving it the full turtle beans. Yeah. <laughs> now we're just mixing our metaphors. That's fine. We got some time. We'll straighten them out by the end. <laughs> Front row, do you want to do roll call? Let uh, everybody know uh, who who's on watch. Sure. In the video chair, this is Steve. Welcome, everyone. Uh, in the nav seat is Kate. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Herc seat, Gabby. Argus chair, Dan. And the manipulator. Oh, nice. <laughs> High five. <laughs> 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 it's going to be that kind of watch, friends. <laughs> Is that the sound the manipulator makes? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> That's the sound the geologist makes when she wants a rock. <laughs> uh, Zoom in there, Steve. <laughs> Dan, can you get it Glad to close they. halfway and stay? Maybe. I think if uh, check those coral okay. cutters. Read right. the brand of these bolts here. Yeah, you we can. We I can. Think they look what did you want to look at, Dan? Oh, just looking at the blades on the coral cutters there. See if there's any rock chips in them. Ooh, I spot a I spy a rock chip. There was a couple in there that were pretty deep when I filed them down. Couldn't get them out. Without, like, far more intrusive action. So, starting off the back row here, my name is Kim. I am sitting in the Science Communication Fellow Chair. So shiny. Shiny. And I am Andrea Balbus, geologist. What's your role? My role is um, poking and prodding individuals to pick up more cubic and uh, angular and chunky, fresh, crystalline, blah, 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 will she ever shut up rocks. 
rocks. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. We want to pick up all the rocks. All the yes. rocks. Yeah. And if you could find something for Dan to slurp, I think he'd be really happy. <laughs> you know, we gotta we gotta give him one of those on this. Mm, yeah, let's test that thing. Have yeah, it, how about a push cord? Run it, run it in a while. <laughs> You're not on SPL. SPL, there I am. <laughs> Show me the uh, slurp gun. Emil, co-watch lead with Andrea. Moral support for her poking and prodding. <laughs> um, and I, I furiously search uh, the animal identification guide to help ID some of the biologic. Yeah. Uh, biologics we come across. It's difficult to identify these things. We sometimes make faces and look at each other with a question mark and point to something on the screen. <laughs> but you don't hear us talk about it, but we're kind of, yeah, maybe. I'm Sarah Brimmer. I'm sitting in the data logger chair, and I am not a biologist, so I rely on the one next to me to and the science chat to give me names. I've got it where I want it. So as we descend here, we're just testing out some of the features on Herc. Oh, where's the danger mark? The danger, you just hit it. It was yellow and then it's red. Is, is it still there? Yep, danger mark. Oh, danger, danger. I'll stop. Oh no, you dangered it. <laughs> danger Dan. Okay. Uh, how do I turn this thing on again? I think I press this button it, here. The, the suction bus button, yeah. Like it's strumming with the descent. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Don't turn on, don't turn on. Yeah, oh, yeah, it seems to be working. Is your pressure dropping? Yeah. Full beans. There's can I have my jam back? You stole all my jam. Okay. I'll no, you can take the jam actually for a little while. Uh, I've gotten ahead of you. No, no, it's one. No, take clean, the jam. Clean, 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 fresh flash jar. Just wiggle, <laughs> wiggle it back into the hole here. Say again? Yeah, it should be on. They usually Sorry, start Steve it up when they're... I was supposed to tell you that he is working on it. Thank you. The other Steve. <laughs> Show me that nozzle again, Cammy. Sorry? Show nozzle? Me nozzle. Oh, okay. Sorry, I shouldn't have taken that away from you. Oh, okay. I think Steve is on it. It's probably in the data lab. Steve, chime in if you hear us. Get over there, you hockey puck. So we got a question about ascent and descent. Which one takes longer? 30 meters a minute down, 15 meters a minute up. Okay. The boat goes faster forward than it does in reverse. Keeping in mind that we often plan these dives to start at a deeper elevation and come up probably still doesn't make a enough of a difference to overcome that difference in, in speed. Is that a mud flap on the manipulator? It is indeed a mud flap. <sighs> oh, there's a linear actuator there with a rod sticking out of it. In that case, I go, ow, 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 which we often do. <laughs> <laughs> it prevents the uh, jaws from demonstration was really great from uh, scratching the uh, the rod on the linear actuator. If they get if it gets scratched, it uh, takes the seal out. And we start leaking oil, and or more likely, uh, we take water in because as the as the nick in the rod goes by the uh, shaft seal on the end of the linear actuator pulls little bits of water in every time and eventually the seal will fail but usually before then the arm starts going spastic and uh, tries to poke her eye out so it's less of a mud flap and more of that thing you put on your couch so the cat doesn't scratch yes, it yes that's exactly <laughs> what it is uh, good analogy can we get the high pack on 
channel three. I'm gonna sure run thing. the uh, run the magnum next. Is it, is it hasn't moved around in a while. So if you're watching the quad stream or uh, channel three Wrong on button. our website or uh, on YouTube, you can see this ridge that we are uh, we are descending on, and then we will move in kind of a north northwesterly direction, following up the ridge. Most of our dives have kind of followed this pattern of descending to the deepest part of the dive and then following the ridge in hopes of seeing some of these uh, sponge and coral communities, or maybe not even in hopes of seeing them, but just to try to determine what variables make these ridges great habitat for them or not so great. We've seen a mix of outcomes on the other dives so far this season. Um. The mappers threw together a, a flader mouse scene specifically for these blue water that shows kind of where we are in 3D and all our different dives. We could Ooh. throw it up on, what is it, three? three? Yeah, let's it's see MB it. It's MB proc. What's oh. flader mouse? Sounds Ooh. cool. Flader mouse is the German word for bat, um, but it's a software from QPS that does 3D visualization that Kate is an expert at, and she's going to sh train me and teach me all her <laughs> special tricks. Um, Erin put together this one. She's really great at Flader Mouse as well. Um, Stand by. That's a great name <laughs> to pick the word for bat or bat. something that is yeah. doing this. Uh, Bathymetry. Yeah. Or it used to be on uh, um, PC something. MB proc. Don't have that one. MB proc? You threw it up the other day. Yeah, we did have it up the okay, other day. Okay, let me just toggle through these because some of them aren't labeled. All right. Correctly. When people were talking about flitter mouse, I thought they were talking about the opera. <laughs> Isn't there an oh, opera that's funny. called flitter mouse? It, is it? Oh, okay. That's the one you have up there. I'll find it. Give me one second. There it is. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's really slow. Okay. Wow. Ooh, look at oh. that. Oh. Cool. All right. All right. So viewers at home, if you are watching the quad or if you're watching Channel 3, we are about to get a tour from our mapping gurus. Sweet. Um, so we started over in Oahu, Honolulu. So this is kind of a zoomed out version just to give you a little bit of orientation. So you have the main Hawaiian islands here and then you can see it as they move outwards to the northwest over here. Um, maybe you can see on the screen, but maybe you can't. You'll see this kind of brighter track and this is the track that the Nautilus actually took to get to where we're going. So I'm going to zoom in and you'll be able to see where we are and what we've been mapping. Um, you want to so hold the shoulder left button for me, Gummy? See things get brighter, um, and yeah. I'm going to keep zooming in, and I'm going to show you where we've been diving the last couple days. Um, this is Don Quixote Seamount right here, and you can see specifically our last thing. two dives up here on that ridge where we saw all of our coral. You'll see the descent with Hercules and Argus here. Then we come up the ridge and then we ascend. Then Cheers if you recall from last night, we did the same thing. We descended down just lower on the ridge, came up and then ascend ascended again. Um, so where we're going today is this seamount or that unnamed volcano hasn't been over to that far right in quite a while. the southwest. Um, 
So you just have our starts. This H1891 is just the name of the dive. We do it, num we increment numerically. Um, so you'll see that we start down, down here on the ridge and then we're gonna climb up the ridge and in towards the top of the seamount. Um, let's see, the summit is around 1,786 meters. Um, and yeah, and this is a cool way to visualize everything that we're seeing. Yeah, and also, Kate, didn't um, this map didn't exist until we mapped it, right? The bathymetry detail here we have here was also done on this cruise? Um, not quite, so I'll zoom out a little bit. And you'll see kind of three different levels of bathymetry. We have this bluish um, shades, and that's from the GMRT base map. And that combines existing high resolution data uh, with satellite bathymetry, and that's probably gridded maybe to 100 meters or so. Then you'll see a little bit higher res data, but it's not the bright, but you'll see the um, specifics of the seamounts of where we're diving. This data actually comes from the NOAA ship Okeanos, and so that's another exploration vessel operated by the US government. And I think this data was collected in 2008. And then you'll also see this brighter, the brighter purples um, in blue. So this is data that we've collected on our expedition and our strategy with mapping when we're not diving is to go in and try to fill in these gaps that the Okeanos missed when they were out here. Uh, so we're not repeating already mapped data, but we're gathering new data to contribute to the world global bathymetry repositories. And what is our resolution at uh, maybe 2,000 meters depth? Um, we are getting to 60 to 75 meters. Really good. And what is the Okeanos' resolution at that depth? My guess is there's about, it's about the same. Um, we grabbed their data from the public repository and I'm going to think it was either 75 meters or 100 meters resolution. So does that mean each pixel or each square is 75 to 100 meters? Yep, exactly. It's amazing. And you can see the difference between um, Don Quixote Don Quixote Seamount, which is a GEO, had once been at the surface, and this unnamed one is a conical volcanic feature that is probably did not break the surface, as well as Euphemia to the uh, south of the unnamed one, southeast of it. Thanks, Kate. That was awesome. Nice tour. Yeah, this is great context. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks again to Aaron for putting this together. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Woo Aaron. Yeah. I, re I really like seeing the Thanks, dive Aaron. tracks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, those dive tracks are super cool. So, yeah, we're going to try to get the feeds of the actual vessels in here so we can pull it up when we're on a dive, but a challenge for maybe tonight. Yeah. Great job. I love it. K2, if you're our listening. Our watchers will love it, too. <laughs> hey. And in selecting these dive sites, we're trying to balance the needs of the geologists who are looking for uh, favorable rock samples and the... Uh, Chris, is a, Chris Kelly's experience with um, biological hotspots for deep sea corals and sponges, so, you know, a certain depth zone that they have been observed to thrive in. So we've been focusing mainly on the ridges. These uh, They were rift zones when the volcano was forming, and so fresh lava flowed out of these rift zones and hardened up into these ridges that we see. And that's where you'll have currents accelerating and creating good conditions for filter feeders. But on this one, we may uh, make it to the summit and see what we have up there. It looks like there might be a rift near, right near the summit. There's a bit of a gap in the topography. So that'll be really cool to see. Yeah. You get some Less slumping. Action. Yeah, some slumping on the sides of these volcanoes. How do we know that they're rift, rig wait, sorry, rift ridges and not just like a, a flow that's still outcrop rather than like talus? It, uh, just a regular flow I don't think would be so focused as these knife edge ridges. So okay. you get that knife edge formed by the magma that came up in that rift. Okay. We've seen sheet flows, evidence of sheet flows along on the sides of these ridges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, interesting mix of sheet flows and pillow basalt and smooth areas with uh, small manganese nodules, rough areas with boulders, some sand ripples indica in indicative of a strong currents. Thanks so much, uh, 
Viewers are going wild for that uh, that map, really enjoying what we're seeing there on Channel 3. Yeah, no problem. It's fun to bring up for everybody. It definitely gives context to what we're doing and where we are. We're trying to hit as many of these seamounts as we can during this expedition to help date them uh, through the geological samples and see if we've got a hot spot chain that we suspect is Cretaceous, um, ranging in age from maybe 85, 90 million down to 75 million maybe on the mm -hmm. southern end. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to give a shout out to Arroyo Grande, California. We have some geologists and biologists, young viewers there who are uh, scooping the scene. Great. Seeing if they want to be future scientists. Yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah says yes. Yes, you do. And Sarah, how old are you? And your how old are you? And what scientific level are you? And what is your s future dreams or aspirations? Oh, okay. So I'm I'm 34. Uh -huh. I have a master's degree. I got it in 2018. Mm -hmm. And um, future dreams and aspirations. I uh, haven't quite figured that out yet, actually. Uh -huh. And I think that's okay. I I run into that a lot. I ask around a lot because I feel like maybe I'm missing out because I I'm not like 100% aware. Yeah. Um, it's more common. Than I thought, which makes me feel better. Yes. Um, right now, my passions are oceanography for sure, um, mm -hmm. and subduction zone earthquakes. And oh, their yeah, subduction oh. zone earthquakes. So you could end up in the Cascades. Yes. Yeah. yeah Pacific yeah, yeah. Northwest. I got my eye on that. Well, All yeah. right, come on over. All come right. on. I got a guest room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I've changed careers three or four times, and it seems to be working out for me. So. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Different paths are okay. Absolutely. Oh, what do we have here? Siphonophore. So I have a question about that. What do you call it? A geode? The flat top mountain? A geode. Geode. Yeah. Geode. Sorry. Um, so that was land at some point, right? That's correct. So Subaerial. Yeah. Would that have been at a time when it could have been inhabited by people? No. Uh, probably not. No. Probably. It was probably uh, above the water 80 million potentially years ago, give or take 10 million. So what what would have inhabited it at that time, if anything? Uh, Cretaceous organisms that um, were um, that could possibly get there from either a continent or were basically inherited um, from probably any organisms that were on the Emperor Seamount chain before they it was subducted it, before it was subsided under the ocean. So you were talking about fossils the other day. Would it be possible to find fossils from that period at the on the? On oh the, yeah, we the have. There? there are lots of Cretaceous fossils around the world, and they might exist on that um, that limestone cap, or we say like this calcium carbonate cap, which would be multiple layers of um, coral that grew to keep up with its subsidence as it was subsiding. Right. So as we see an atoll. Um, modern day where you see the coral keeping up with the island subsiding, that would have been happening happening 80 million years ago as well. So the organisms that you would see in those fossils, which would be the cal largely calcium carbonate fossils, um, would b reflect the organisms that dominated at that time. And we look at those organisms to tell time in the rock record, and we call that biostratigraphy. And that was originally the first way that we could tell time in the rock record and see where we were in time. And then now we've had multiple advances through the geologic sciences. Now we have radiometric dating that um, we use to use chemistry to um, define when a rock was formed. And that is now also brackets the biostratigraphy. So in many instances where we don't have ages for rocks, we still rely on the biostratigraphy, meaning the evolution of different organisms through geologic time. And we use them as time markers. So if we were looking for fossils or happen to come across one, what, what would we, what would they look like? Well, Chris Kelly tells a story once that he was, um, uh, diving. I can't remember where he was. And he is also a fossil collector. He loves fossils. And he was zooming by looking at the seafloor trying to find some sponges. And he saw a megalodon tooth that he says was stood out and looked exactly like a megalodon tooth and was at least uh, seven inches long. And he thought, man, 
That's that would cost me so much money if I bought it, but there it is, just sitting on the seafloor. So you can see things like that, megalodon teeth, mm. or the megalodon shark that was enormous. Um, that one was manganese encrusted, oh. as as was this uh, what we think is a skull of a beaked whale that we came across on one of our dives this expedition. Yeah, which dive was that? Oh, we did see one. We yeah. did. Yeah. Where was I? <laughs> Probably sleeping. That was on another watch. It was, I think, like yeah. The third. I just learned about this the other day. Yeah, yeah. me too. Uh, <laughs> no, you're no. not on SPL, though. No. Yeah. Uh, so, did they? They didn't. Um, <laughs> they didn't attempt to to oh. recover any of it, or no, they just no, looked they at the. No, they collect fossils. They or just anything. imaged it. Oh, we're not allowed to collect fossils. Yeah. You know, just so there, as a I haven't seen any of those images. Are they in the in the highlights? Yeah, or hot, on the hot tip, friends. Yes, yeah. Your on science, the website? your science communication fellow looks through all the, you know, pictures from all the watches. So, uh, you need to see all the coolest pics. Let me know. We are getting some of those up on our website uh, soon. So look for those on NautilusLive.org. It was interesting that they said the beak was what we saw, and that was the last part to decay. Is that what they said of the of the, the whale? The skull. The skull. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. Yeah. So in tens of millions of years, will the Hawaiian Islands be guillots? Is that their yes, fate? Yes, they will. In tens mm -hmm. of millions of years, the Hawaiian Islands will be guillots. That's correct. They'll be sinking as the crust beneath them cools, contracts. But there will be new ones by then, right? That's correct. New ones are being formed now. so um, As long as that hot spot stays active. Exactly. As long as the hot spot stays active. And we know that there are hot spots. I think the oldest one we know of currently has been active for 120 million years. Um, but that doesn't mean they can't be active longer. It just means that we don't have the evidence of it. And it's important to remember that the oldest oceanic crust is about 180 to 200 million years old. So even if a hot spot was active um, for that amount of time or longer, we wouldn't necessarily have a record of it because we, u we are able to reconstruct um, the life and evolution of a hot spot um, that comes from the core mantle boundary by the, a the chain of age progressive seamounts that are um, on the ocean crust. And so we, that's why we date these seamounts to um, define how the plate moved over the plume over geologic time, how fast it moved, and when it changed orientation. What's the age of the um, hotspot, the, the Yellowstone hotspot? Is that older? Um, so I don't know what the age of the Yellowstone hotspot is, but it was once in the ocean, and then now it is under the continent, and it is what creates the uh, super volcanic eruptions that are potentially around, um, happen every about 600,000 years, I believe. Um, so the Yellowstone hotspot used to be under the ocean. Yes, it is hypothesized that the Yellowstone hotspot was under the ocean, and then it, the the continental crust, the North American plate, moved over it, and now it is under the North American plate, and that's why it creates such large volcanic events because it is not a subduction zone um, derived volcano like you would see in the Cascades, but actually a plume um, that's coming from the core mantle boundary, generating melt from those. Uh, Steps. So if the Yellowstone hotspot made a chain of seamounts when it was in the ocean, those are gone. They're yeah, so they can be subducted. So that's what I mean by the oldest crust. The crust is constantly being subducted as it's being made. Um, so it sinks down below the continental crust and is subducted. And when it subducts, it actually melts and it liberates some of the water that it has a lot of water because it has a lot of sediment and that um, generates melt and our, um, our volcanoes that we see like in the Cascades. So uh, Mount Hood and Mount St. Helens are all the volcanoes generated from that type of process as the Juan de Fuca plate subducts under the North American plate. Um, and so the crust is always being basically consumed. So the record that it can tell us about has um, a time limit, and that time limit is around 180 to 200 million years.
So where where is this um fossil picture? Capture highlights? Yeah, it's in capture highlights. Uh, and I think it was the third dive. Eighteen eighty six. Might be. Welcome. Okay. I might have to use it when I do my chant. <laughs> mm-hmm. Might have been the next might have been the next dive. I'm not real sure. Any idea what time that? Man, that was so long ago. It was like a lifetime. It was definitely not on our watch. I don't see it in eighteen eighty six. Yeah, check the next day. Or the next dive. Kate, are you guys going to do some more mapping adventures for us? We like those. Um, yeah, absolutely. We okay, can make those some are fun. Videos. I think tonight I'm going to try to put it into Flater Mouse Eight. Right yeah. now, the scene's in Flater Mouse Seven. <laughs> Look and at that guy, Gabby. We're going to try to get <laughs> the feed of Hercules um, during a dive into it, so then you can nope. see Hercules with reference to the 3D visualization. Oh, that would be nice. I love it when uh, they use ArcGIS to do those flybys. Don't you love those? Yes, yeah. What are those called? Flybys? I'm not quite sure, actually. Yeah, those are awesome. <sighs> Let's take a core sample. <laughs> so, other ship. So is there a reason we haven't dove on the top of the guillot? Well, because the top of the guillot, number it's one, it's not going to have the crystal. It's going to be covered in the calcium carbonate rock. It's a wave cut platform and wave cut platforms. And they so we won't be able to get to the crystal rock that will tell us the age of the formation of the volcano. And number two, it doesn't have the biology that we would be t that we're targeting for this study. Is it because of the depth, or because it's more not not the right um, substrate for the corals and stronger sponges? stronger currents over the knife edge ridges? Um, we think. Right, I see. Yep. You might have some uh, current strong currents on the rim of the geo, so that's a trade off. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing we try to do. We're trying to balance both objectives as we go. So we have a lot of discussions about this, but you wouldn't probably guess, but we have a lot of discussions about our dives and where we select the dive sites and uh, what we might find there. We even discuss um, how, who and how we'll use the bio boxes. Um, will we use them for rocks? Where will we use them more for organisms? And that's largely dependent on how much rocks we how many rocks we might have already gotten from a seamount, and the um, uniqueness of the organisms we think we might encounter. So um, there's a lot of strategy involved, but sometimes we have to do things on the fly. It's a very impressive teamwork. Yeah, indeed. We're getting a question in from a viewer. Thanks for your questions. You can keep them coming on nautiluslive.org. This one might be for you, Sarah. Um, oh, just oh, stepped she out. She just stepped out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you were wondering about the labs on Nautilus. Mm -hmm. What can be done on board sample wise and what comes ashore for later analysis? So can you talk about a little bit? Yeah, about Andrea? everything comes on shore for later analysis and all of it is archived. Um, so the rocks go to the rock repository where the metadata is logged in um, to a system that you can archive that you can access over an archive that is shared on the internet. Um, and that allows you to see the latitude, the longitude, and the depth of the rock that was recovered. Oftentimes, um, some rock report repositories will also include a thin section and images of the rock. 
um, which will help you identify its crystallinity and its petrology and its potential chemistry. Then for the uh, biological samples, um, dependent on their, I think, their rarity, so it takes a long time to identify a new species because it's not done on its um, macro uh, morphology, but also on microscopic identifications. And those samples, I believe, go to Harvard, which is the... Uh, the Harvard Museum yeah, the of Harvard Comparative Museum. Zoology. Yep. The Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, and so they are accessed there for or scientists that want to identify them or cross-check them with other species that they might collect um, to determine if they have a new species or um, if it is actually the family and shares a identifying characteristics with uh, different species. So everything is so valuable here that we get <laughs> on the seafloor, and it it's so rare that we um, really log it and we um, make it available to everybody um, to have access for as long as possible. As a matter of fact, these, um, these places that store the rocks and the um, uh, biological samples are committed to um, storing these things for per perpetuity, meaning they have to account for them forever, at least transfer them wholly and in good shape to a different um, archive that would take care of them so that they are um, never abandoned or lost. And if you're watching on Quad View or on Channel 3, you're getting a live view of the uh, lab here on Nautilus. You can see those uh, drink coolers there. Um, they covered over where it said cold drinks and it says cold science. And there's uh, one of our scientists there. Uh, I think that's Beth working on her samples and, uh, basically doing preservation and basic, basic sample prep here on board and then storing the cold samples. I think the, uh, the best piece of scientific equipment I've seen in the lab is a giant hammer <laughs> that is being used to take big rocks and make them into smaller rocks. Uh, so we're doing basic prep. You can see one of the rocks, I think, back there on the uh, right side, right middle, in the, on the counter in the back. Big chunk of basalt, big chunky basalt. Beth has a, a tool that I think she calls it a sonic pulverizer, which is like a... <laughs> Awesome. Metal cylinder that has a kind of a piston that goes into it, and then she hits hits that with rock with mm -hmm. a hammer. Mm -hmm. Pretty and cool. It, and it gets all the uh, all everything she wants from the outside off. I think it it's the it turns it into like a uh, you know a fine yeah finer dust yeah. But she just goes with a chisel and a hammer to and get the manganese crust off to start. Yeah. Great question. Thanks so much. We don't often get to show these other views except during these blue water times. And uh, the lab is busiest right after we bring up the vehicles. You will see four or five people working in there, um, very tight quarters, offloading all the samples off the vehicle and bringing them in as quickly as possible for preservation. So we talk about the blue water parts of the dives and uh, while we might not be seeing these high density sponges and corals, uh, we can show you some behind the scenes views of the ship that you don't get to see every day. I do have a question about the dive plan. Okay. When we reach the bottom, is our goal to ascend the ridge on top of the ridge or kind of move to either the east or west side where it might be steeper or just see what we see? Top we're of the ridge. Top of the yeah. ridge, yeah. We're starting off at the top of the ridge. Top of the ridge, here we come. Yep, and we're going to get some rocks early in the game. Okay. And then we're going to motor. We're going to motor and until we see biology because we're looking to basically see if we identify any because we don't know exactly our time that we're coming up from this dive. Uh -huh. So we're trying to be as efficient as possible. So it might come up at midnight. It might come up at 4 a.m. Copy. But, yeah, so if we don't see anything, we just want to motor. Okay. At, at point two knots. Yeah, point two. Yeah. That's, yeah. I'm glad that I was going to follow up with a clarifying question of sure. motoring and not motoring. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. At point two oh knots. That oh. is our technically our motor. That is right. Okay. So <laughs> we're turtle power. Turtle power. Do our best to get as many sharp cubic 
rocks as possible. Yes, big chunky cubic and rocks. And squishy rocks. Squishy uh, I rocks. Think Beth is going to pick her squishy rocks because okay. she knows what the rounded, Perfect. as uh, Chris calls them, the rocklets that she picks up for having microorganisms in them. The rocklets. The and rocklets. And then, um, I mean, hopefully we see the biodiversity and right. density that we want to, but yeah, so we want to get there. And we're landing at, what is that? Oh, yeah, 2,400 meters. And we've been seeing the diversity more around 20. 300 meters, 2250, correct? Yeah, I think um, the shoots and ladders, candy land, uh, sponges, <laughs> that area, I think was uh, 17 or 1800? Yeah, 1900 to 1700 yeah. or so. A really wide range, though, of, yeah. of, yeah, of depths. In general, 2500 to 1500 is the expected range. Right. So how many new species of coral, sponges, or any marine life have been discovered by this team? On this on this expedition, we won't know for some time. We've seen some things that are of keen interest to the scientists, both here on the ship and ashore. But uh, further study will be needed to make that claim. Uh, anybody want to talk about past new species that they've been a part of on other nautilus missions yeah so the 2018 papahanamakoakea marine national monument um, expedition uh, with chris kelly he potentially identified our group potentially collected and identified seven new species um, it takes some time for them to be officially determined as a new species so they are still investigating and um, looking into different characteristics of those uh, samples. Sometimes it's the geographic distribution of a species rather than discovery of a new species itself that is of importance too. Um, on the Galapagos expedition in 2015, we were the first to see this uh, wonderfully named flamboyant squid worm <laughs> in the Eastern Pacific. <laughs> it, it, it was only discovered in around the Philippines in 2012. We were the first to see it in the Eastern Pacific. It's probably worth a Google if you're listening at home and you want to see a flamboyant squid worm. <laughs> I, I think it's worth it. You should check it out. There yeah. is a video on Nautilus Live uh, YouTube channel of the flamboyant squid worms. Looks a little strange swimming swimming in the midwater column or a few meters above the seafloor, but on the seafloor, you can kind of see its design, the purpose of its de design. It moves very nicely, uh, exploring with its tentacles on the front of its body and using its fins to uh, navigate along the seafloor. And so it's a worm that looks like a squid? Is that why it's called a squid worm? Yeah, these tentacles on its on the front of its body looked like a squid. And where did you, where did they think it was confined to before you saw it in the Galapagos? It had only been seen around the Philippines, somewhere oh, in the Western wow. Pacific. That's quite a range extension. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Very bizarre looking. And I think we've had a couple of those moments on this dive as well, where we're seeing, I, I remember one species of coral that was a, perhaps a new depth record that it w was seen several hundred meters lower than previously documented. That one that Megan identified for us, the dandelion? dandelion. Yeah, the sea, sea dandelion, sea dandelion. yeah. Was, I loved that one. I think it's the only one we've seen on this cruise. So far. Thanks for your questions. Keep them coming there on nautiluslive.org. We'll get to them as we can. We're at uh, 1,382 meters. So we have, what, 600 meters to go-ish? Oh, here's a great uh, question. 1,100. Oh, 1,100, yeah. Who has the best job on the ship? Who has the best job on the ship? And I'm going to say, if you pick your own job, you have to pick a second best then. Gosh, who has the best job on the ship? Hmm. 
That's a tough question. That is a tough question. That's an easy question. Gabby has the best job on the ship. <laughs> and Gabby's job is? She's the bus driver. I'm the bus right. driver. And I I pick Steve's job. Oh, you like Steve's job. Steve's a pretty, Steve's got a pretty cool job. Mm -hmm. Which Steve? You, Steve. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fair. Because I'm not allowed to pick my job, which is no, no, you could pick objectively your own. the best job on the ship. But if you pick your own, you have to pick a second. <laughs> okay, there we go. I actually really like Argus seat too. Can I have two seconds? Uh, you can have thirds. No. Just like Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner. You can have first, seconds, and thirds. I'd swap with Steve or Dan. I'll have to pick my job because I get to interact with my wonderful students at California State University, Long Beach. They are, um, they are go-getters. They got a good hustle game. They work hard. They don't give up. And I'm always impressed. Nice. That sounds wonderful. But if you had to pick a second best job <laughs> on the ship. Second best job. I feel job. like this has gotten very competitive all of a sudden. <laughs> I would have to say, yeah, Stephen's job is pretty But I don't know if I... See, the other thing, I could pick it, but I would not be as good at it as they are at oh, all. That, That's the yeah, problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think Steve's got the most technology in front of him yeah, in it's a close a, proximity. So. a ton of blinky lights, and I think that's what draws me to his chair. I think, oh. you, I think you guys forget that you're driving the robots. <laughs> <laughs> Picking up rocks. All we are is a glorified HDSDI input for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you make the magic happen over there. Uh, not so sure. Emma, who do that's you think quote, has the best job That's a quote from your boss. Ship. From Ed? Uh -oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> he would. That sounds like something. Ed yeah. Would say. That's like, which part of the body is the best part? You know, <laughs> we're, all, we're all working together. Uh, I'll, put, I'll give a shout out to the navigators are uh, all intimately involved with uh, all, every move of the dive, really. Um, coordinating with the bridge to position us right. It's like um, trying to position a helicopter above a dark city. Uh, lowering a jeep down below to explore, you know, 15,000 feet below, uh, and Sweet. and they and they work to make the maps ahead of time, the first step in ocean exploration, and then they're using them during the dive. So, I think the navigator job is pretty cool, and and uh, created an internship slot for a naval academy midshipman to serve in that role. Oh, so yeah, that was you. Hope to see them coming back out <laughs> in a year or, you know, next season or afterwards. Also, Coast Guard Academy cadets uh, were coming out for that as well. Nice. So how tall is the Empire State Building? Don't know. Google knows. Google knows. I don't have Google. I got you. I think for scale, if you use that... Maybe it's more like lowering a basketball. It's, a of it's 102 stories, uh, 1,250 feet. So my next question is, how many Empire State Buildings would be dangling under Nautilus yeah. to reach the seafloor? 2,400 meters. Uh, well, from our from our position right now, or from now when we get to the. Uh, when we get to when we get altitude, so what when we're when we can see the seafloor with her, roughly. So we're diving at twenty four sixteen today. Twenty four sixteen meters. Round it to twenty four hundred if you want. Is this math time with Dan? No, it's doing? just uh, it'll give us some <laughs> perspective. So. How many Empire State Buildings would you have to stack on top of that? How'd, I, how'd you say it? Geode? Geode, yeah. Geode, before uh, the the top of the top of the stack would poke poke up above the. So you know, almost eight thousand feet. Uh, and what is the Empire State Building? Did we say? One thousand two hundred and fifty feet. Seven and a half Empire State Buildings, roughly. It's a lot. A lot. That's a lot. 
You ever oh, yeah. been on top of the Empire State Building, Dan? So that would be like, how many stories? A lot? <laughs> yeah. 111 times. Seven, seven and, and a half. half. Yeah, there you go. So if you were standing on top of those and you had a string that was going all the way to the bottom of the stack, and there was a golf ball on the end of the string. And you want to move it around without hitting any mailboxes, cars, <laughs> yeah, street and you were, signs. And you had to move it and predict where that golf ball would wind up. That's what the navigators have to do. With a little flashlight on the golf ball. Yeah. And and you'd have some wind. But you got another golf ball right above it, keeping an eye on everything. <laughs> That's Herc and Argus are the golf balls in this oh, scenario, yeah. just in case we lost you there. To make it more complicated, yeah, it would be two golf balls. It's more like a drone hanging below a golf ball, but tethered. Right. All this to say, the nav and mappers are super important. What I thought was amazing, that first seamount that we mapped, the summit depth changed by eight or 900 meters from what we had previously thought based on the low quality mapping data we had to what we found when we did the high quality mapping before our first dive. So yeah, we, um, we're making big discoveries in all of these fields. They're not all as flashy as some of these uh, charismatic uh, biological discoveries, but the rocks and the mapping is pretty cool too. Mm -hmm. Nav, is it possible to get a north arrow on the map? On the uh, Flater Mouse map? The Flater Mouse map? Uh, maybe, let's see. <laughs> I might have looked at the uh, cameras up there. Um. Let's see. Tools. So this uh, flater mouse that they're talking about is not the opera. It's the view on channel three of your quad <laughs> view, or uh, the channel three on YouTube if you're looking for that alone. Basically, football-sized pixels, a whole bunch of football-sized pixels. Is that, is that a proper analogy in there? Yeah, football or football field? 75. What's meters. that? Football or football field? Slightly different scale. Football field. Yeah, okay. So is it pixels or is the grid a football field size? Uh, sorry. Say say again. I was. Is it actually? A, is it actually? Uh, each pixel corresponds to that s that area, or is it the grid that we see? Each well, square the, of the grid corresponds to that. The area. the square in the mesh that makes the map. Yeah. Uh, that's a. Uh, yeah. So I wouldn't go off that mesh square. I think that's just a visualization thing. Uh, let me turn off that layer so we don't get confused. There we go. Oh, that gets rid of everything. I could um, watch you zoom around in Flater Mouse like all night. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, yeah, so each pixel is going to be 100 meters by 100 meters. In each this. pixel. Yeah. I wonder if we can zoom in enough that you can actually like see a little bit what a um, pixel would be. No, not really. Okay. Maybe here you can kind of see the pixels in here. Yeah. And how many uh, meters between our start point and our target today? 2.7 kilometers, I believe. Yeah, that's about it. Um, the, cool, the cool thing there, if you okay, think about, cool. like, have you ever gone to the monster truck races at a stadium? I have. So <laughs> <laughs> I filmed them. They Oh really? Yeah. Nice. They set up that whole monster truck course in a stadium, right? Yeah. In the about the size of one yeah. pixel there that we're seeing on the map. So that's why we often find like yeah. a monster truck course 
where we don't expect to That's see one. Great perspective. Because the resolution is. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that was excellent. That's why that reminds yeah. me of that dive just the other day when we found a monster truck. Course. Oh, totally. Yeah. It was like a cliff and a jump, and you were that flying we all over it. it. That we navigated at 1.5 turtle speed. Ah, yeah. Uh, that's really funny. A terrain park on the ski mountain. That's why that makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really terrain like park. The monster truck <laughs> It could be a BMX course or a downhill mountain bike course. <laughs> I'm sure right, we could get bank this turn. <laughs> I'm sure we could get somebody to Photoshop some giant wheels onto Herc in one of those nice Argus shots we got yesterday. I've been to a monster truck thing indoors. Oh. Herc doesn't need wheels. It can jump off a hundred meter cliff, no problem. <laughs> As we sometimes tease the navigators and call them navigators because their their scale when they're mapping between when the when they're mapping and when we're actually in here navigating that's a it's a huge huge leap for us sometimes though. so we got Herc and Argus descending. Down here, the, the blue water part of the dive. We are at 1,740 meters, going to around 2,400 meters. Kate, is this type of map always available for the seamounts that we're diving on, or is it something that had to be put together and took a lot of time? Um, Aaron put this together. Yes, it generally can be always available. Um, did she have to plot out the dives that we had already done? Yep, so what, because every dive um, exports an XYZ fe feed, so we have a latitude, a longitude, and a depth associated, so we can import those into this scene. So what we start is we just start with a blank, blank map, and then we start bringing in our different grids, whether it's data that we've mapped ourselves, so multi-beam data that's been cleaned and processed and then gridded, and then we can import it into a scene. Or in this case, we have access to data from other ships um, and grids from other ships. So this was the Okeanos data and then various background data. So you put in those um, and you make the color ramp the way you want and the exaggeration the way you want. And then you can start adding, importing those points. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but it's just making the clicks to make it work. It's very how many, cool. How many hours do you think she has into that? This one? Yeah, there's a lot of manual work in there to, to smooth out those football field size grids and uh, take out the anomalies and I see where you're going yeah so for processing the data yeah it can definitely be time consuming and it really just depends on the quality of the multi-beam data so if the weather is really rough we might have bubble sweep down that goes underneath the ship where we have the multi-beam mounted and that can kind of degrade the data um, when we run mapping expeditions, so we don't have any ROV dives, we just have mappers. We have a full mapping team um, as well as interns. And we usually get a good like workflow in terms of data acquisition, data processing, data products, and we can knock out those really nice grids pretty quickly. Um, but on ROV dives, all of your mappers are usually on watch being navigators, so it, we usually just do preliminary processing and get what we can. Try to clean out the outliers. So do we output any KML files? Like, uh, I know you can go on uh, on the line and find some ROV dives in KML files and then play those in, in yeah. Google Earth where the ROV flies around and you can see the pictures and stuff. Yeah, you can do that. We have it in KML files and we, the grids can also be outputted in KML files. So you could do this kind of exact same visualization in Google Earth. You don't have to have flight or mouse. You can also bring them into a GIS like Esri Arc Map or Arc Scene and kind of do the same thing. Um, just Is that something we publish for the scientists or for, for uh, the website? Or yeah. Occasionally we'll do fly throughs and videos with the flight or mouse or with Arc. Um, and put them up on the website for people to see, especially on the mapping cruises when we're fully map staffed and we have extra time. I know there's quite a few online for like the Endeavor vent field. You can fly through with the ROV and- That's so cool. You can see the maps overlaid on 
uh, Google Earth, the high-level bathymetry maps. To so a very astute viewer is saying if Kirk and Argus can see the terrain in even more resolution than the mapping data, are we updating that mapping data after we uh, dive with data from Herc and Argus? On some on some expeditions we are. We have a, a multi-beam that's um, sometimes mounted on, on Hercules. So it's basically a miniature version of 